Hey, listeners, welcome back to another episode of Being at Work. In my opinion, this is a very special episode. I've hosted over 150 executives on this show over the last three years. And as soon as I met today's guest at an event he keynoted a few weeks ago, I dreamed of having him on the show as this is a conversation that needs to be had. Jeff Smullyan is the founder and CEO of Emma's Communications, and he's releasing a new book with a great title, Never Ride a Roller Coaster Upside Down, reinforces the truth that the path to success is anything but straightforward. From owning a major league baseball team to starting America's first all sports radio station, to creating the world's two largest hip-hop radio stations and managing everyone from David Letterman to Ken Griffey Jr. Jeff has experienced the roller coaster ride of entrepreneurship from every side. But what I'm most grateful for and intrigued by is what has kept him in the game and how he speaks out so openly for equality and pushes legislation that is inclusive and protects the rights of all. Listen in as we talk about leading for the long-term game and the impact that media has had on dividing us. You know, listeners, I'm in a season right now where I find myself leading through big challenges that are going to take a lot of hard work and heart. And Jeff's example and words are inspiring. Check it out. I always love media. When I was a little kid, I listened to baseball games on in top 40 radio on, on transistor radio, really in my room, like a lot of people in my generation. And Always loved it, always knew what I wanted to do, always started. I realized quickly I wasn't going to be a major league baseball player because I wasn't given enough talent and I decided I wasn't going to be on the one side of the mic, but I just love management, uh, loved being an entrepreneur. I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. So I always wanted to start a media company and I went to undergraduate school, was going to get a master's, decided at the last minute to go to law school and I studied broadcast law and then a few years later, started my own company, which is what I always wanted to do. I've been doing it for over 40 years. It's been fun. Well, and so you've documented all of that in this book that's releasing on November the 8th, mm -hmm. Never Ride a Roller Coaster Upside Down. And so I suspect that, that that represents your entrepreneurship journey, the ups and downs along the way. It really does. I have a saying, I had to be an entrepreneur because I'm not capable of being hired by anyone in a free society. And the genesis of the book was really, I have an 18-year-old daughter, and I drove her to school every day for years and years, and we just talk about life. And one day she said, Dad, nobody would believe these stories. You've got to write these stories down. And when COVID came, I started writing, and the next thing I knew, I'd written 300 and some pages and sent it to a couple of friends, and they said, look, you got a book here. So we got, I got an editor to tighten it up and got a, uh, an agent and then a publisher, and the next thing I knew, I had a book. How has that process been for you, writing all of those stories down? It's been the most cathartic, fun process, every part of it. I just finished the audio book uh, last week where my agent said, you got to record the book yourself. We're not going to get a third party to read it. It's your story. It's your voice. I said your voice is decent enough that it will be okay, which is fun. But every part has been fun. Now we're talking about promotions, starting interviews. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to read it myself. Here in Indianapolis, obviously, Emmis is a well-known brand and your leadership has yeah. quite a legacy, but also the owning a major league baseball team and creating two hip hop radio stations. And there's a lot of experiences there that are highlighted in the book. Well, we've done all sorts of things. I am a big believer that we've been successful because I've been blessed to have great people working with me. And we've done all sorts of crazy stuff. I had two chapters in the book. When I, WFAN, which is the world's first all sports station, was sort of my baby. And everybody said it was the stupidest idea of all time. So that chapter is going from idiot to genius because when it worked, I started as an idiot and was an idiot for about a year and a half. And then it turned around and I became a genius. And I've always said the line between being <laughs> an idiot and genius is very fine. And you go back and forth. 
And the next chapter was Genius to Idiot, because when I bought the Mariners, I was the boy wonder. <laughs> we were the world's greatest marketers. Everybody loved me. They put my picture on a Wheaties box. Everybody in Seattle loved me. And then all of a sudden, we started losing money. And we said, well, we can't do this anymore. And I went to Idiot. So I've always said, yeah, if, number one, my last few months in Seattle taught me one of my favorite sayings. Everybody should be a pariah once in his or her life. I got that thrill in Seattle, and it prepared me for so many other things. But if you're doing anything, you're going to be on both sides of the idiot genius line. Yeah. Well, and there's a story. When I heard you speak recently at this event that I referenced in the intro, you, um, you told a story about being at a, a Pacers game with your dad. And mm -hmm. your dad had acknowledged like how lighthearted and fun. And you made this comment about the difference between being a fan and an owner. Yeah, he he turned to me and he said, boy, you're really excited. You're really having fun. You're rooting for the Pacers. And he said, when you when I'm at Mariners games with you, you're very calm. I said, you know, number one, you try not to make a spectacle of yourself. The previous the guy who owned the team before us once danced on the dugout. And I said, if I ever dance on the dugout, shoot me. So you want to be very stoic. You want to be calm. And also, you're just <laughs> thinking about a lot of different things. You're thinking about payroll and marketing and ticket sales and Anybody's got a substance abuse problem who's playing on your team. So when you're a fan, you just get to be a fan. Then you don't have to worry about all this stuff. Right. Just get to be a fan. And your dad highlighted that. So good. Mm -hmm. Well, this event that I saw you speak at, Jeff, it's quite fortuitous because as I told you, literally an hour before I went to the event, I was on the ACLU of Indiana. I was on the website just checking out right. all the, the over 700 businesses who had now have signed the don't ban equality, you know, in opposition of Senate Bill 1. Right. And uh, just for our listeners, you know, Senate Bill 1, it was recently passed in Indiana as you know, near total ban on abortion. And just a lot of organizations are really concerned about restricting access to comprehensive reproductive care because that threatens the health, the independence, the economic stability of both employees and customers. Yeah. And I was so glad to see that MS was on the list, right. a large organization, really, who have you always stood for equality. I mean, I think that's an important part of your brand. And mm -hmm. But there weren't a lot of large organizations on that list. And so it, MS really stood out to me. So I go to this event and then you are there, Jeff. And I, I was like, oh, this is so, I'm so grateful to be able to connect with him and, and chat with him about that and the signing of that letter and standing in opposition. So what's that like for you? Well, you know, listen, we try to be a leader in a number of causes in this state. You never do enough, but we've always tried to be in the place where we thought was doing the right thing. Clearly, this is one of them. I've had several people say, why was the RIFRA response from the corporate community so different than Senate Bill 1? And I think, and I was one of the seven or eight CEOs that negotiated behind the scenes to get the RIFRA bill, if those listeners remember it. It was kind of an anti-gay bill, basically. Mm -hmm. And it was right before the National College Championships. It was a firestorm. We lost probably billions of dollars at conventions. Salesforce said, we're not moving here and building a second headquarters if you follow through with this. The NCAA said, we'll move out of town. They were even talking about canceling the tournament a week later, which would have been logistically impossible. But it got a lot of us involved, and the bill was toned down. This time, I think, and I, you're, Andrew, you're right, a lot of companies didn't sign the ACL letter or some of the other ones. I can tell you that the major employers did try to temper this. As a matter of fact, James Briggs of the Star wrote this. They were there talking behind the scenes to key legislators and the governor. They felt like this was one, it didn't matter whether they were out front or not, because the key was, can we make a difference? And the answer was no. One of the problems was when RIFR came about, Indiana was on an island. The whole country was focused on Indiana and what the legislature and the governor had done. With the abortion bill, Indiana was one of many states, so we didn't get the national focus. And I think it made it harder to put pressure on the legislature and the governor to temper the bill. And when we talked recently, Jeff, you and I were talking about how reversing this is going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of energy. Yeah. And But there have been a lot of times in your career when you've had situations like this where you knew it was a long-term strategy goal. How do you lead in situations like that? Well, you just have to keep your eye on the long-term goal. 
I have two older kids and an 18 year old daughter. And I said, look, and she gives as incensed about this as anybody, but all of my kids are, but you just have to realize the famous line, the arc of history may bend slowly, but it always bends in the right direction. And I think this will reverse itself, but you have to realize there are forces in this state and in this country that feel very fervently the other way, and they've developed a, an awful lot of power. And even though the majority, I think, feel the way you and I do, yeah, you know, it should be a woman's decision about what to do with her body. When a minority gets the kind of power that they do, it's going to take a while to work through it. Yeah. But that is the fact that there are so many people that are protective of women's rights and see this as a women's rights issue. I mean, that right. that does give me some comfort and some hope that there'll be some change. I imagine that this November, the election cycle is going to look a little different than it has. Well, I think that's the key. I think people have to realize this is a function of voting. And if you believe strongly in this, and I think what you're seeing, what you certainly saw in the Kansas vote, which Kansas is a state that's every bit as red as Indiana, and the, the bill protecting the right for women to choose won overwhelmingly, I think you're going to see that if people really follow through and vote, you can change. This country, you can change a lot of things. You go out and vote. And I think that's the question. Do people feel strongly enough that they're going to go out and say, I want to make changes in some of these people who do these things. I don't want an office anymore. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of it. Most definitely. What about, I'm curious how, how you in moments of like real challenge or someone come like attacking your opinion, your perspective, Yeah. how do you respond? I mean, this, cause this is one of those topics. Yeah. You talked about it being really emotionally charged and like both sides having different perspectives. And I struggle with like sides. I mean, here we're all human beings. We're all struggling. We all have fears. We all want to be valued. There's so much we have in common, but the anger and the meanness that comes out when we try to have conversations keeps us from having conversations. I think that's exactly right. I think we have to tone down the rhetoric. I have a lot of very close Republican friends, conservative friends. Number one, I think in any debate, you almost have to laugh. Now, you might think this isn't laughing matters, but you just have to tone down the anger. You have to realize people arrive at decisions for their own valid reasons. Now, you may think they're not valid. I may think they're not valid. But in this debate, like it or not, is to a ma a, not a ma majority, but a significant percentage of the population, a debate about religion. And once you start argue with somebody's religious views, you're not going anywhere. All right. So I think the most important thing is to be tolerant and respect it, but work to change it among people who view it differently. Well, and, and just that, that mindset of people arriving at decisions for valid reasons, that will drive a curiosity and openness, more of a willingness to ask questions. Right. Well, I think the only thing that really scares me, and I've said this, I may have said it in that speech that day. We had a congressman in Indiana named Earl Langree. I don't know if you remember this story, but it, I think it tells us a lot. In 1974, the day before Richard Nixon resigned, Langree was a congressman, and the reporter said, where are you on Nixon? And he said, I'm with him all the way. And the reporter said, what about the facts? And Langree said, don't confuse me with the facts. Well, don't confuse me with the facts was a disqualifying statement for Earl Langree in 1974. But don't confuse me with the facts is a major part of our debate where if we can't agree on fundamental facts, it's really hard for us to make progress. And that's the most shocking thing I see today is people go up. I don't yeah. care what the facts are. I, that doesn't matter. That's a bad thing in a democracy. Well, and being in media, I bet it's been interesting for you to see the impact that media has had on that division. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, we have media bubbles. If you're involved in talk radio, in the radio industry, most of it's very conservative. I'm a big First Amendment believer, but there are things I hear and I go, I just don't know if anybody is not just making things up. And that does scare me. Remember, if you watch Fox News, your view of reality is totally different than if you watch MSNBC or CNN. Right. You may get all Trump all the time on CNN, and you may get three hours of Hunter Biden on you know Fox News. And the problem is it's very hard if you live in any bubble not to understand other sides. And I think that's 
frightening. You know. How did that happen, those bubbles? How did those get so strong? Well, because we're segmented. I grew up at a time when there were three major networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC. And Walter Cronkite was sort of the arbiter of information and everybody respected. He was the most trusted man in America. And Walter Cronkite, if a story was nonsense and not backed up by the facts, it just didn't rise to his show or he would call it nonsense. Today, we have different segments. I've always said, look, if I was there when Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch created Fox News, I could understand what they did. They came in and said 70% of the public believes ABC and CNN and, and, you know, and NBC, and 30% don't believe them. We're going to create a network of the people who don't believe them, and we're going to cater to what they believe. Now, the problem is that what they believe has gotten further and further from the mainstream, and they cater to that. And that, that to me, is the most frightening thing. And now, the interesting thing is that you're going to finally see litigation because they talked about the Dominion voting systems being controlled by Hugo Chavez, which, by the way, is hard to do because Chavez has been dead for a decade. But basically, and Dominion sued Fox and some of these other networks for defamation. And I think it's going to be an interesting case. But, you know, you just have to wonder. I mean, it is hard for me to believe that 30 percent of America believes that the last election was rigged and that uh, former President Trump is right. And yet he lost 62 lawsuits, many of them in front of judges. There's no evidence whatsoever that the election was rigged. And most people that I know in the Republican Party know that, but a lot of them won't say it because they don't want to upset his followers. And they feel that if his followers don't like them, it'll end their careers. It's a very frightening thing. So where is it headed? Well, I think you're going to see at some point this shake out. There's too many people who realize that this is nonsense, even though it's sort of taken a stranglehold on the Republican Party. I tell my wife, it's like bricks in a wall. Every time you see something new, another brick comes out of the wall. And most people don't pay attention to it like you and I do. So you and I sit there and go, how can people believe this? But most people just, you know, they have their own lives. They don't think about it. But as information comes out, whether it's the hearings or the FBI, people start to say, wait a minute. I mean, I don't know what was in the FBI documents they seized, but all I know is this had happened any time in history that the only word people would say is treason. Mm -hmm. That's what they would say, but we're in such a heightened thing that you don't, it's like you got 30% of the people say, well, of course he took the documents. Why shouldn't he? Mm -hmm. So it is, I think it will, when enough bricks come out of the wall, the wall will crumble. Mm -hmm. And when the raw crumbles, you'll have a rational Republican Party that's focused on real issues and real policy debates, which we should have. For most of my life, you had Republicans and Democrats debating yes. policy, and, and it was a very civil, rational debate, and usually they reached a compromise. We've gotten away from that in the last five or six years. Yeah. Now, that's not all just Trump, but Trump certainly is the, the main driver of where we are today. Yeah. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about other media and the future of media and the impact that social has on how we are consuming information. And I mean, my daughter gets her news from TikTok. So. Yeah. Well, the problem is the social media is this great democratization mechanism, sort of, but it also allows for just absolute misinformation, falsehoods. Yeah. So it really ratchets up the temperature on things. that, and, and we also know that foreign entities, whether it's the Russians or the Chinese, have been pretty adept at manipulating it. So while it's a great democratizing thing to have information shared widely without sort of gatekeepers, it's also led to a staggering amount of misinformation, disinformation. Yeah, getting to the truth today is hard. It's hard to know what is real and what isn't real. It is. It really is. That has been the shocking change to me, is that truth is sort of like, like I said, facts don't matter. Yeah. Once facts don't matter, I don't know how you have a civil society. Yeah, because what's real? Is it just everyone's yeah. own reality has become truth? It's Yes, it's, it's yeah. a really interesting time, isn't it? 
it's got to be just fascinating for you, like having spent your entire career in media to see the vast difference today than when you started. It really is. It is just the changes in radio and TV and cable and now streaming services and podcasting change so much it's unrecognizable. You know, when I grew up, every kid had a transistor radio and then later every person had a Walkman or then later a boombox. Now everybody's got a phone and it's their camera and it's their social network and it's their news feed and it's their the audio. I mean, it's, you know, the phone is ubiquitous. It's, it's their computer. It's everything. So any crazy like futuristic predictions around what media will look like? I have all sorts of theories, but... <laughs> Give me one. I'm so curious. Well, I mean, I think traditional networks will continue to diminish. You just look at television viewing. For the first time this last quarter, more people watch streaming services, Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, than watch ABC, NBC, CNN, CBS. So that, that is changing. The, the problem is the economics of the streaming services are very questionable. Mm -hmm. So we, I see a lot of things that, are, that get great cachet, great interest, whether it's streaming audio or video, or that may not, you know, that may be hobbies because they can't make any money. So those are all things that I've seen and observed. It's going to be interesting to see how it evolves. When we talked a few weeks ago, you were talking about being grounded in your North Star. And mm -hmm. that is a place where I can always go back to my foundation and my anchor. And it's particularly in the world in which we're living. And just all of the, think about all the uncertainties. I mean, this, our whole conversation has been on the uncertainties and the challenges. And so tell us about that. Like, how has that been helpful to you throughout your career? Well, I think you got to know who you are, what you stand for, what matters to you. On my trips to school with my daughter, I would always say, you got to have grit. You got to be persistent. And I, I think I've told this story a lot. So she had a paper due and the paper was on the most important quality. And she said, I know it's got to be grit. And I said, no, it's not. It's integrity. Integrity is the most important thing. If you, And as I've said, if your word is good, nothing else matters. And if your word's not good, nothing else matters. So I think you try to live up to your values. You try to do your best every day. You try to say what's important, what's right, what's not right, and live your life accordingly. Yeah. Well, and it sounds so simple, but it is a grounding effect, isn't it? I mean, I, I have my values written right here on a post-it note, and I can always, what would those values do in this moment? And they bring me yeah. back to, to, to who I am and what I stand for. And because there's so much I can't control, I can always control that. Yeah, you're always, you're always going to be tested and you're always going to, you know, I've had a lot of discussions about now that my youngest is going off to college. What do you do? What you're going to have situations that are tempting and you got to look in the mirror and say, am I comfortable with who was, I am as a human being? And I think that's the most important, the, the mirror test. Can I get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, yeah, I feel good about me as a human being? Yeah. Well, and what I so appreciate about that is naturally like that is going to you are going to say the hard thing, but you're also going to be open to other perspectives and being willing to engage in conversation. And both can be true, right? I can be vocal about what I believe and. Yeah, you have to understand everybody comes from a different, different place. The most important thing is to treat people with respect. Do not, another one of our commandments at Emmis is never get smug. I always think hubris kills. When you, when you believe the rules don't apply to you and you treat people differently than you want them to treat you. I think it's a major problem. Mm -hmm. Never get smugged. Right. It's <laughs> great. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being here. I so appreciate your willingness to connect and share and looking so forward to the book. Thank you, Andrew. What are you most excited about the book release? I think just seeing if it resonates with people. The, you know, I've always said, look, if, if it's funny and it's readable and they like the stories and maybe the lessons come through, the book is really about my experiences and the lessons I've learned, stories that I hope are funny. People who've read it said, boy, there's funny stuff in here. So we'll see. I think it's just such a new area. Yes. I've been doing management of a company for 50 years. Now, all of a sudden, I'm hawking a book. So that's totally different. But, but it's, it's fun. <laughs> totally new experience and fun. Well, it's par for the course, isn't it? I mean, trying something and that's what the book's all about. And that's what you're doing through this. It's exactly right. You do different things. And I've been fortunate. Every part of my life has been fun. 
I've been surrounded by people I love, whether it's my family or my coworkers, friends in my industry. So it's been a great journey. I have no complaints. Well, and thank you so much for, thank you so much for signing the ACLU letter. Thank you for standing up for equality and for women's rights and doing the right thing. Since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, I've really struggled. (laughs) You've inspired and encouraged me to just keep going, you know, keep leading, keep talking about it. You never quit. Keep aligning with other business leaders who agree. And so thank you for for that. Yeah, Andrea, the most important lesson is you never quit. You keep fighting. Yeah. Thank you. It's been fun. Well, and all I have to do is is think about my daughters, right? Absolutely and right. That makes it pretty easy. That's exactly yeah, exactly. I'm. I'll be out canvassing this weekend for some of my favorite <laughs> candidates. Wink, wink. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast to never miss a being at work story. 